And we have um, two more readers still to go, and I want to welcome my colleague, John Talberg. Thanks, Susan, for inviting me to read. And I usually have to read last at these things, so thanks, Richard, for having a Y in your name. <laughs> um, I'm also going to read part of a longer piece like David, though I'm going to follow his wife's advice and read from the beginning. Um, about 15 years ago, I discovered film noir, and I thought I'd write a, a mystery, and then I put it in a drawer in my uh, filing cabinet because, oh, let me make sure I know what time it is. All right. Um, put it in my filing cabinet because I don't write mysteries, and it seemed like I, kind of a weird mystery. But I got it out, and started working with it recently, and so I'm going to read just the opening to it today. It's written in two different voices. One is a series of letters, and one is the narrator's voice, and so I'll try to give some space between them. They're presented in different uh, type font in the text. Okay, it's called No Motive. Go to the journal offices and ask for the French man. He will help you to find the murderer. The closest I could get was three blocks away, so I was walking. It was humid for April, and there was a mist in the air. I turned up the collar of my coat, tilted my hat forward to block the spray. The offices were in a brown four-story building stuck between two skyscrapers, insignificant as a child's block with its letters sanded off. A man in brown suit walked past going the opposite direction. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw him slow, the gleam of wet, bald head rotating to follow. I'd received the letter earlier that morning and had thrown it in the wastebasket and fished it out three times. The murderer? What murderer? I wasn't looking for a murderer. I didn't have anything else to do. Business was slow. I hadn't even had a cuckolded husband case in three weeks. I was beginning to think I should go back to writing ad copy. Inside the front office at the journal, there was only one person in the lobby, an elderly man in jeans, army surplus jacket and a hat pulled down over his face, gray wiry hair, hugging himself, rocking and mumbling. The secretary was a doughy woman with curly neon red hair. She chewed something, the right side of her mouth, a grimace, swallowed, then said, can I help you? I paused, felt silly, stupid even. I was a character in a paperback novel. Clearing my throat, I said, I'm here to see the French man. She stared, blinked. What? Um, do you have a French person working here? You mean Mr. Verdu? Yes, that's his name. I forget his name before, but that's definitely it. I wiped the sweat from my forehead. What is his office number again? She tilted her head and squinted, touching a pencil's eraser to a bottom lip. Is he expecting you? I nodded once. Yes, definitely. She peered at me out of one eye, and I half expected her to say, you're lying. 213, she said, and then turned back to her typing, hunt, peck, hunt, peck. Up the stairs, I moved down a dim hallway with a fluorescent bulb flickering at one end. The building seemed strangely empty, and my shoes clicked on the floor. A balding man came from an office, nodded and smiled as he glided past. There it was, number 213, 13, unlucky number, ha ha. The sweat trickled down my rib cage. I had a bad feeling, the office door ajar, light bled into the hallway. Mr. Verdu? I pushed the door and somehow wasn't surprised at the corpse staring back at me behind the desk. A short man, he had greasy black hair and a thin mustache like a magic marker swipe on either side of his nose. His white button down was soaked with blood running from a deep wound in his neck where a hunting knife projected from below his Adam's apple. The blood gleamed almost black under the humming fluorescence, and the man's eyes were wide, a mouth of frown. A computer screen glowed on the orderly desk next to a wire-out in basket filled with papers. A sheet of typing paper lay in front of him, uncapped, gold found in pen on the desk next to it. The paper was full of half-formed sentences and scribbles and a doodle of what looked like a man with a knife in his hand and a grin larger than his face. Near the bottom of the page were a couple lines of writing untouched by scribble, Try right bright. It's out of sight. The color of your teeth should always be... He had really written the ellipses, the last dot, more a dash, a skid smear of ink. There was a note pierced by the knife positioned between the hilt and his neck. I ripped it off, glancing at the black type, and, touched, and shoved it in my pocket. The knife had gone all the way through, points sticking into the back of the chair. The window behind Verdu was open, screams of children on a nearby playground drifting up. It had stopped raining and the sky was bright, no breeze, the room almost airless. 
I had the sudden thought I was inside a gigantic dead thing, this window a wound. More screams, laughing. I took a deep breath but could not fill my lungs. There was a loud shriek, short, sharp, suddenly choked off, hint of gasp. The receptionist leaned against the door jam, face like parchment, meaty fingers, clutching lips. You will be confused and horrified by this turn of events. Whereas you entered this game with a sense of amusement and curiosity, you will find yourself frightened, perhaps angry, wondering how something as seemingly innocuous as a two-sentence note could have become so scary, you will want to know who set you up and accordingly go back to your office and await further instructions. I was driving back to my office. Two cops, plainclothes men named Nation and Hellos, had questioned me and peered sideways out of pin pinprick eyes, obviously disbelieving everything I told them. They were large, chunky men with pale complexions and yellow teeth, wearing identical gray suits with hats they left on indoors. They could have been fraternal twins with physical differences too insignificant to mention. They shook heads, scratched chins as they passed around the note. The first one, the second remained a secret. They made much of Verdue holding my job of 10 years previous. Oh well, no motive, extenuating circumstances, we can't hold them. They sent me on my way with instructions not to leave town. Yes, sir, I wouldn't think of it. I know the rules, I'm as perplexed as you are. There was something not right about going to my office to await instructions. Shouldn't I be looking for clues? Wasn't I playing this guy's game? I didn't know. Most of my cases had been tra trailing unfaithful wives and husbands trying to find runaway kids or lost long relatives. Hours of phone calls, driving, sitting in cars, some photo taking. Once I investigated an arson in a bar I frequent, never caught anyone. But murder? What did I know about murder? I parked in a lot near my office. The sun warmed the street, burning away haze, steam shimmering. Some kid, about 19, sat on the pavement, leaning against the office building. A purple mohawk, he was wearing a leather jacket, pierced with safety pins. He had a large ring through his septum. As I neared, he looked at me through slit bloodshot eyes and held out his hand. Could you spare some change? I pulled out my wallet and handed him a dollar. Hey, thanks, man. I kept walking, waving his thanks away, looking at the ground. Unlucky my office, I removed the back in 15 minutes sign and the phone rang. Hello? What? No Holmes Detective Agency? Are you already out of business? Honey, I noticed there was a suspicious murder in the paper this morning and I thought, Mom, Mom, no, I said, I'm not out of business. But I can't talk now, I'm expecting an important call. Oh, I suppose your mother is an important cops and robbers, car chases, gun battles, Mom. My stomach churned like it often did when Mother called. I just called to tell you some man brought an envelope by for you. An envelope? Yes, the plump red-eyed man. This plump red-eyed man came by. At first I thought he was the postman, but Sam has been delivering my mail for years and this fellow wasn't even wearing a uniform. I hung up and ran out the door. Of course it shouldn't be that important where information comes from. What difference does it make whether a letter emerges from one's mailbox, is delivered by a helpful neighbor, or is left with one's dear old mother? However, these things do matter, don't they? You would do anything to shield your mommy from something nasty, wouldn't you? Spirit her away, checking the rear view now and then to make sure you're not followed? It would be a shame if the dear woman were stabbed in the neck like that poor French fellow. Or if her tender gray head were bashed in. These days, some sick individuals will even rape and torture a woman like your mother before murdering her. It's uncivilized. We drove down Maine a few blocks from Mom's house. She quietly hummed, tapping her fingers against her open window, now and then commenting on the beautiful day. Wearing a gray denim dress and straw hat, she twisted the strap of the battered leather purse on her lap, a half-smile on her face, blinking as if on the verge of sleep. Her skin had a grayish cast, almost translucent, revealing blood-coursing veins. Stopping at a light, I looked in the rearview mirror. No cars, but I was worried. I bit the inside of my mouth. Can't you tell me anything more about this guy? She stared out the window. Hmm? Oh, yes, the man. He wasn't my usual mailman. Sam has de been delivering my mail for years. I tip him, every, I tip, tip him $10 every Christmas. That's nice. How about what he was wearing? Any tattoos? Now that you mention it, does seem that he had been drinking. She rubbed her chin. Yes, I smelled alcohol. A horn sounded. In my rear view, a man in a white convertible was making a backhanded gesture at the light. I drove through the intersection, watching the car, and he turned right, flipped me off. Oh, there he is, Mom said. Who? The nice drunk man who brought the note. 
I slammed on the brakes in the car stall. The balding, chubby man, probably in his late 30s, early 40s, was coming out of a bar named O'Malley's, walking the other way down the sidewalk. Are you sure, Mom? She sighed, of course I'm sure. I'm not senile. Restarting the car, I pulled to the curb, getting my 45 from the glove compartment. Oh, now I suppose things will get violent, she said, smiling. Just sit tight, I'll be back in a sec. After waiting for a car to pass, I crossed to the other side. Hey, you, I yelled to the guy, wait up. As soon as he saw me, he took off, disappearing down the first alley. I rounded the corner, gun drawn, but he was gone. The alley dead ended about 100 yards away, and there were three doors, a pile of garbage in front of one and the others with no handles. I stood, stood still, held my breath, bleaking sweat from my eyes. A car drove past on Main. A dog barked. A truck honked, its brakes groaning. Birds chirped. Someone was breathing, panting, metallic, labored gasps. I threw the lid of a dumpster back, and it crashed against the brick wall, vibrating my molars. The man leaped up, hands outstretched. Stepping back, I raised the gun. Don't shoot, don't shoot, he said, suddenly meek. Slowly get out of there and put your hands behind your head. Please, please, he blubbered. I patted him up and down, the blackened brick wall stretching up on either side. Sweat ran down my face, neck and rib cage, and the dumpster reeked of something rotting and sweet. The guy stank too, but of whiskey and wasn't armed. He swayed and I worried that he would pass out, so I pressed him against the wall and held him there with one hand. He was short, maybe 5'4", and the black hair which wreathed his head stuck out like steel wool, sweat beating his dome-shaped crown. Tears squeezed from the corner of his eyes. Please, please don't kill me, he begged. I sighed. Maybe. I spat on the pavement. It's just occurred to me that you're not in charge here. His eyes widened and he nodded, a desperate smile on his face. He had a gold tooth in the center of his mouth. That's right, man, that's right. It's not me, it's not my thing. I know, that's what I just said. Tell me who paid you to take the lady the note. He looked at the ground. I don't know, I was drunk. His eyes flickered up, but he kept his face averted. Give me a break. You were too drunk to remember what the guy looks like, but you, know where to t you knew where to take the note. Really, man, he said, his voice loud, placing a filthy hand on my jacket. I looked down at the hand, blackened nails, scab on the index finger. He took, his hand he took his hand away and spoke in a confidential tone. I wouldn't have even remembered if he hadn't written down what to do. I was scared not to. He frightened me. If he frightened you so much, why can't you remember what he looks like? Medium height, short hair. He looked like everyone. He could have been you. He left me a hundred bucks at O'Malley's. Take it. Just don't kill me. It's hard to believe you can't help me any more than this. I worked something out of a molar with my tongue, meaty. Leaning closer, I spoke in a whisper. I won't kill you, but I could shoot you in the foot. You're tied up in a murder. Try going to the police. His face glistened, the collar of his shirt dark with sweat. He opened his mouth as if he would speak, but instead, of a, instead a clicking emerged from his throat, and then he turned and vomited down his arm. Wretches ricocheted off the walls into the sky as if something invisible were pulling his lungs out. The regurgitated odor of whiskey was everywhere. My mouth tasted like ashes, and I wanted to spit, but didn't want to open my mouth. His eyelids flickered as if he might pass out, and I said, Hey, relax. I'm sorry. I was kidding. I won't shoot you in the foot. Look, I said, pointing at a garbage can. Sit down. The garbage can was metal, brand new, the only thing in the alley, not sooty and faded with age. I gently pushed the guy into a sitting position on the lid. Tilting his head against the wall, he closed his eyes, sighing and wiping his forehead with the back of a hand. There was a loud groan from beneath him, a crack, bending metal. His eyes popped open, pupils expanding, the garbage can bent and then cracking along a seam, yellow and green mush seeping, also a black color, moving hundreds, maybe thousands of cockroaches, some three inches long. The can split apart like wet cardboard and the insects crawled over the guy and he screamed, writhing, swatting at himself. They scurried across the sweatshirt, down slacks ripped from the dumpster over the cracked pavement. I stamped on one, then two, their shelled bodies cracking like dry twigs. The guy screamed, get him off, man, get him off. Overwhelmed, I turned and ran up the alley. As I reemerged into the street, the man screamed again, loud and drawn out, as if his life depended on it. Undoubtedly, you have spent the last hours driving around the city, pulling onto the interstate, exiting suddenly, slipping into parking garages and leaving by different streets, pausing at busy intersections and not moving until right before the light changes. You feel certain you have shaken any tails by the time you tuck your dear old mama into bed. Why shouldn't you be confident? You're a professional. No one can keep up with you through all that, at least not without you detecting him. 
Of course, in today's high-tech world of surveillance, an electronic tracking device would not be difficult to come by. Anyone, though, who would engage in the primitive art of windpipe puncturing is probably too old school to know about the sneaky assortment of bumper beepers on the market. But you should be sure just to put your mind at rest. As soon as you are done reading, search your car for any suspicious items, alien hardware, weird electronics. Don't forget to call your mother to make sure she's alive. Then you'll want to go to the Golden Buddha and order the Buddha's delight for takeout. It's a vegetarian item, quite tasty. Often as I've followed you over the past weeks, I've seen you put the most disgusting filth into your mouth. Dick, as soon as an animal dies, it begins to rot. Frying doesn't remove the rot. Avoiding death is futile. Ponce de Leon never found the fountain of youth. I shoved the note in my coat pocket, picked up the phone, dialed the motel where my mother was staying. After punching the sixth number, I realized what I was doing and hung up. I walked quickly back to the parking lot. The sun was almost down and the sky was gray, clouds billowing overhead like smoke. I searched the car, engine trunk beneath the seats, glove box beneath the car, the bumpers. I wasn't sure what I was looking for, but figured I'd know it when I found it. Tiny, electrical, maybe an antenna, definitely incongruous on the body of a 78 Chevy Nova. I didn't find a thing. Driving to a payphone, I watched the mirror. If someone were following, I'd see him sooner or later. Mother didn't sound pleased to hear from me. You're calling during murder, she wrote. What now? Nothing, I said, watching traffic through the plexiglass of the phone booth. I just wanted to know if everything is all right. Of course it is. Do you need anything? No, honey, but you know I love this show. Go catch your bad guy. All right, I just wanted the commercials over. Bye, I love you, she said. Click. In my car, I chewed a thumbnail, pulled the note from my coat pocket, smoothed it on a knee. He didn't mention the little guy from O'Malley's, so it wasn't in the plan for me to run into him. I needed to get another break like that, somehow upset the order of events. I started the car and drove down Broad Street until I saw a gold neon sign, the Golden Buddha. In the darkening sky, a neon fat balding man with slits for eyes appeared and then disappeared. Dine in, carry out, flickered red at the bottom of the sign. Checking for cops, I did a quick U-turn, parked in the lot across the street. The restaurant was situated in a block corner. All the other slots were dark, either closed for the day or forever. Through the glass door of the restaurant, a Chinese man wrote something on a pad behind the counter. When I pushed through the door, a bell dinged. The man, a small fellow with short black hair, looked up from his writing pad and smiled. Ah, welcome, sir. Picking up a menu, he asked, just one for dinner? Um, no, I think I'd like to, something to go. Can I look at the menu? Yes, sir. He handed me a paper menu and I flipped it open, scanning the list of items. There it was, beneath the heading, meatless entrees, Buddha's delight. Buddha's delight, I said. Ah, very good. Anything else? No, that's it. Thanks. He disappeared through a pair of swinging doors, shouted something in Chinese. The resta restaurant was dimly lit and about three-fourths full, several families, a few couples, all Asian. An obese man with a thin mustache sat at a table in the corner by himself. He was wearing a gray tailored suit and stared at me. I watched him for a few seconds, but he didn't look away, eyes narrowed above a faint smile. I nodded, turning, buying a pack of cigarettes from the glowing machine near the door. Not really a smoker, I smoke when I'm nervous. The man who had taken my order returned with a brown bag. Soy sauce? I paid for the meal and grabbed a couple packs of matches from the basket next to the register. Exiting, I leaned against the light post on the corner, opening the cigarettes and lighting one, letting the clear plastic wrapper fall to the pavement where the breeze carried it down the street. The street light buzzed loudly and moths banged against the bulb, wings making propeller whirs inside the plastic cover. The smell of stir-fried vegetables and fried rice drifted from the warm bag beneath my arm. I hadn't eaten since that morning. Taking another drag from the cigarette, I dropped it to the pavement. The ashy taste remind me, re reminded me why I wasn't a smoker. Thanks.